Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to the first webinar for AHPs that has been organised jointly between AFAC and BOFAS. Um, this aims to be a series of webinars for AHPs that are going to give us lots of information about foot and ankle injuries, conditions and how possibly we can work together with our orthopaedic um, colleagues to maximise rehab. So, just a couple of housekeeping things first of all. If you all look at the bottom of your screen, you will see there's a little Q&A box. If you click on that, you should be able to post questions to Simon throughout the talk. And what I will do is just throughout the talk, I'll look through those and um, we can put them to Simon in a Q&A session at the end. Please try and not put them in the chat function, keep the Q&A section so I can make sure I'm not missing any for you. Um, so the talk will last for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. So the only other thing for me to do is welcome Simon Clint, who's a foot and ankle trauma consultant at Cheltenham General in Gloucestershire. He also works at Nuffield Health Hospital in Cheltenham. He has an interest in sports medicine, being one of the doctors for Gloucester Rugby, Cheltenham Racecourse, and also does ma other major eventing competitions such as Gatcom. He has a strong interest in trauma of the ankle and a significant amount of his practice spent fixing acute injuries. Therefore, he seemed the ideal person for us to talk to us about pilon fractures. So I hope you enjoy the talk. I'll hand over to Simon and then we'll have some questions at the end. Thank you very much, Jodie. Um, so I, I was uh, very kindly asked uh, to give you a run through on pilons and really try to link it together with rehab. Um, as always with these talks, you have to have a disclosure. And my disclosure is I'm not a physiotherapist. I do work closely both with Jody and her team and with a lot of the sports therapists and sports physiotherapists. But at the end of the day, I'm an interested amateur. Uh, but I do hope my referrals are a lot better than hashtag please re rehabilitate. So, I spend my day messing around with toes and doing big things to ankles. And um, that's very much my training. I, I only do foot and ankle now. And I spend my weekends looking after eight stone jockeys and 18 stone professional rugby players, uh, both of whom managed to injure themselves with remarkable ease. So hopefully in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna be able to get over enough about pilon fractures that you can understand the principles of pilon fractures, how patients sustain the injuries, and a, a brief overview of things like classification. I'm going to take you through the principles of surgical treatment and how it's really evolved over the last 50 years or so. I'm going to touch on common surgical complications because that I think is the most important thing, thing about rehabilitation. It's balancing rehab with complications and understanding the feedback between complications and their effect on rehabilitation and vice versa. Um, and then really, there's very little I can find certainly about rehabilitation in the literature. So really just my personal philosophy on rehab after injuries like this. So, what is a pilon fracture? A pilon fracture is a fracture that of the distal tibia that extends into the weight-bearing joint surface. So it's not an ankle fracture. Um, it's one that involves the main weight-bearing portion of the joint. And it's called pilon because apparently it looks like a pestle from, the pe from a pestle and mortar. And which I never really understood until you turn a picture upside down. And I suppose it does look a bit like a pestle and mortar. Uh, however, we really ought to be calling it a mortier fracture because the mortar is the bowl and the pestle is the talus. Um, but it, they do occur in a very similar way. You've got the, the bowl of the distal tibia and the pestle smashes up the talus smashes up into the distal tibia. Sometimes they're called plafond fractures. And again, they're called plafond because it's French. And plafond, for anyone better educated than me, is a ceiling. 
So it's the sealing of the ankle joint or the pestle pounding into the mortar is a pilon fracture. So how do you sustain <coughs> um, pilon fractures? They're fundamentally, they're an axial load of the foot. So something either pushes up or the body comes down and causes a load either directly under the talus or to the front of the foot, forcing the foot into dorsiflexion, or the back of the heel, forcing the foot into plantar flexion. And these really are high energy injuries. To begin with, um, the, they were described predominantly in uh, ski resorts from falls, but certainly in my practice, it tends to be high energy, energy collisions bad falls from horses that kind of thing and you can imagine the pedals of a car when you cave in the front of your car the pedals get shunted forward and your foot gets forced into dorsiflexion so these are very high energy injuries and as a result they're very very different beasts from the twisting injuries uh, that typically cause ankle fractures even bad ankle fractures and I think that's where a lot of the problem comes with post-operative management of pilon fractures, is if people aren't used to them, if people don't see them frequently, they think of them as a slightly worse ankle fracture, and they're very different. And hopefully I can explain that over the next 10 minutes or so. So why are they, why is it such a different beast? It's the amount of energy, rather than just a twist, but it's, it's a very high energy transfer of energy to the bone. And the bones commonly shatter like this one has. And you can imagine the amount of energy it causes, uh, it requires for a young person's tibia to do that. And in imparting that force to the bone, as it shatters, that force doesn't just disappear, it gets transferred to the soft tissues. And unlike nasty femoral fractures, for example, where you've got all the muscles of the, of the thigh to help absorb that force, that energy, an awful lot of it goes into the soft tissues and there's nothing to absorb it. So the skin gets a real pounding. So these are bad injuries. And the main reason they're bad, apart from the damage to the actual bone, is the soft tissues and an awful lot of the management of pilon fractures is about soft tissue management. So the classic paper that every orthopedic registrar is expected to know about is Rudy and Orgauer in 1969. They were part of the AO group in Switzerland. Um, they were part of a group really popularizing fixation of fractures, moving away from the wartime putting everyone in traction. And as a group, they were popularizing, opening up fractures, rigidly fixing fractures with screws and plates. And this was really the, the first paper to really describe pilon fractures. And they outlined their principles of treatment. So opening these fractures up and fixing them. Um, but what's important about their work is they were in Switzerland, they weren't seeing uh, high energy road traffic accidents routinely they were seeing bad falls on snow fields which although they can be nasty are nothing like hitting a wall at 60 miles an hour um, as part of their paper they came up with a classification system which again all orthopedic registrars are supposed to be able to parrot and this is nice and simple it's undisplaced and it doesn't seem to matter how smashed up the joint is as long as it's undisplaced. Displaced but not comminuted or in lots of bits. Now unfortunately because it's nice and simple it is very subjective and any classification system which is subjective really isn't very reproducible and there's some good papers showing that orthopedic surgeons just can't agree on whether a fracture is a two or a three, whether it's undisplaced or dis slightly displaced, because it is subjective. But 
that's the, the, the basic classification. Um, they, the same group then went on four years later to publish the page, paper that really changed things. And they managed to give, I think it was eight year follow up or something like that, of the majority of the fractures they had treated in the last 10 years with far better outcomes than the, the, the standard treatment at the time. Just briefly, if anyone is interested in research, the classification that is, tends to be used in research is the OTA, the Orthopedic Trauma Association, or the AO classification. And this is very reproducible, but it's fiendishly complicated. Um, I couldn't actually find a diagram showing the whole thing. It's too complicated. But um, it's subdivided by three, and then by three, and then by three, and then by another three, to give a total of 27 types. I've yet to come across anybody who uses it in their clinical practice, but if you're wanting to do some research on pilon fractures, that tends to be the most uh, quoted classification system. So, how has pilon management changed over the years? As I said, the real, the real cutoff was in, in the early 70s when Rudy and Al Gower produced this landmark paper. And before then, they were tended to be treated as limb threatening or limb ending injuries. They were wrapped up in plaster. Sometimes you had a Steinman pin put through your heel and your heel dragged out, a bit of traction wrapped up in plaster, wait for them all to heal and then deal with whatever you're left with. And then this paper came out. And if you remember, I said that these injuries that they were describing that they were giving these good results for um, were in fairly low energy skiing resort injuries and then this paper came out and surgeons throughout uh, the states and europe started really quite aggressively fixing these opening the ankle up splaying it open lots of screws beautiful looking x-rays and unfortunately, although they could get beautiful looking x-rays, they just couldn't reproduce the good results that they were getting in Switzerland. They had really high infection rates, um, lots of wound breakdowns and that kind of thing. And it, it thought that this was because they were dealing with much higher energy injuries. And if you think back, that's the energy that has gone from being in the bone to into the soft tissues. And those soft tissues just weren't coping as well um, with the techniques that the Swiss were managing to use in their um, uninjured or relatively uninjured skiers. So then there was a movement away from this aggressive type of fixation to perhaps just putting one or two screws in and then an external fixator, possibly something like a Lizroff, but more commonly something a bit more simple. And certainly when I started my training, we were taught that these really didn't do well with big plates. And the way forward was to send it to an Elizabeth surgeon. And that's how I first got interested in them. And then um, what we found there is people were doing well, the, the skin was being respected, but the overall alignment or the outcome wasn't great. So then in the early noughties, there was a move to a balance where patient comes in, they get an X fix put on, they, and that allows time for the soft tissues to heal. It stabilizes the fracture, and then you can go and do an open reduction internal fixation, so internal uh, fixing the fracture, but you re respecting the soft tissues a bit more. And uh, that's certainly probably what most units carry out. However, in some units, particularly if they've got better access to theatres, they've realised that if you can get patients to theatre early, within kind of six, 12 hours, a lot of that injury to the skin hasn't happened because it's not holding a displaced fracture. And more and more people around the country are realising if you can do careful approaches that respect the soft tissues quick enough, you can avoid some of the nasty wound complications, but still being able to fix this. 
but that's very much um, limited number of surgeons at the moment. So why am I going on about surgical management? It's really because it impacts how we're going to rehab them. If a patient has soft tissue injuries, we're certainly not going to let them move the joint for a bit. It's going to slow down time to wake bear. So it's going to affect how long we want to immobilize them, how long we want to protect that joint. Because this is a joint that's been blown to smithereens. You really don't want the, the body weight of the patient transferring through that joint until we're well and truly happy. So very briefly, and I realize this isn't a talk about fixing um, pylons, but as I said, delayed internal fixation, which is probably what most of you will come across in your practice, unless you're working in a very busy trauma unit or trauma center. The advantage of what we call span, scan, and plan, so you, they come in with their blown up ankle, you put put an put a external fixator on nice and quickly, that just lets the soft tissue settle, means you can get a CT scan, and um, you can plan for possibly two weeks down the line, once the skin's healthy, to do your procedure. So the advantage is it allows soft tissues to recover. It does have problems. We're, we get a bit twitchy around pins that have been going through skin and sitting there in the ward for two weeks, and there is a concern about skin infection from the pins. Um, obviously it does require a second procedure, but also it sticks a patient often in hospital um, with their ankle immobilized, often not in an ideal position. You can see in that picture, I'd like to stress it's not one I did, but um, the foot is in equinus, and that's not a good position to, to leave an ankle, particularly an injured ankle, for a couple of weeks. Ring fixators, they're, they're really good. They're usually strong enough to let a patient wait bare early, and they have very little impact on the soft tissues. Downsides, your accuracy of reduction is probably not as great because you're not really opening up the bone. Um, almost every patient, if you've ever looked after somebody with a, a lizard off frame on, will get some form of pin site infection. And unfortunately, a lot of pin site infections are due to soft tissue movement. And um, that will therefore slow down rehab. And usually we have to span the joint because there's not enough bone distally. And then there's this kind of this balance of small plates rather than big plates, small holes, but fixing it immediately. So how do people do having had a peel on fracture? Well, the brief, the brief answer is really not well. A very interesting paper that looked at quality of impact, uh, sorry, qu uh, quality of life following a peel on fracture, and it turned out to be worse than having AIDS, having diabetes, having ischemic heart disease. So this is life-changing injury. And I always, always tell the patient, I can't undo what happened the minute your car crashed. I can hopefully put things in a better position, but the damage that has happened has happened. And I also tell them I will be over the moon if they have a stiff but pain-free ankle, because that, from this kind of injury, is often a really good outcome. So I think the important bit of this talk is really the complications and how that impacts rehabilitation from these injuries. Because it doesn't matter what we do to, this, to the bone, we can make the most beautiful looking x-rays, but if we don't get the patient rehabilitated, if we don't get some return of function, they're not gonna do well. And as I said before, the big problem I find, um, particularly with registrars, is they don't appreciate that it just is a, not just a nasty ankle fracture. So what are the common complications? And these are common. Superficial wound complications in papers occur from anywhere from 5% to 17% of pylon fractures. Thankfully, deep wound infections, although they do occur and they can be devastating, aren't as common. Uh, Post-traumatic stiffness, as I said, is almost inevitable to a degree. 
and even patients who have done brilliantly, if you compare them to the contralateral side, even if they've got good functional range of motion, they will lack range of motion. Uh, Non-union, where the bones don't heal, almost inevitably it occurs when the metastasis, the dif distal bit of the bone, fails to heal onto the shaft. And all these add up to give you chronic pain, a limp, and limitation of function. And finally, although surprisingly rarely, patients get post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Uh, one paper I found looked at 10-year follow-up following nasty um, pilon fractures, and only 5% of patients had had an arthrodesis after 10 years. And most of these, I think, are helped or hindered by appropriate stroke inappropriate rehabilitation. I don't think even the most grumpy surgeon can blame a physiotherapist for osteomyelitis or osteoarthritis, but certainly I'll, I'm going to touch on wound complications and, and the others and how good rehab can really help that. So why do patients get superficial wound infections? I've already said th this is bad stuff happening to bone, which means that it's bad stuff happening to soft tissues. And the problem is if you then look at the cross section of the anatomy down by the ankle, if you have a look at that, only about a third or possibly even less of that tibia is covered with anything but a few stringy tendons, a few nerves and some skin. So we go in there and we flay that leg open and we're either going straight through skin onto bone and then putting a plate directly under the skin or we're lifting up the only good bit of muscle that's feeding the skin, uh, sorry, feeding the bone and feeding the skin. So unfortunately, as I said, wound with superficial wound problems occur in up to 20%. And the reason that is relevant to rehabilitation is that wound problems certainly happen if there's too much movement of skin and certainly over joints, especially the knee and the ankle and the elbow, I suppose, um, too much movement of skin will cause problems. So that delays mobilization of the ankle. And we're here desperately trying to get this ankle from not being stiff. And against that is this risk of infection. So we'll come on to how I manage that later. And you may see a bit of a reoccurring theme here, but post-traumatic stiffness is the same, almost this terrible triad of bad things happening to bone and they're bad things being done by surgeons. And we put huge amounts of metal just under the skin where in essence, there's tendons and a few muscles and, we're, and there's not much space and we're putting a whole load of metal in um, just under the tendons. And then just to make your life even more fun, we're wrapping them up in plaster for a long period. And then we're surprised when all those tendons are stuck down to the metal, when uh, the muscles around the back of the ankle are stuck down. And when um, we send them for some rehabilitation and they come back stiff. And finally, once again, a reoccurring theme, why don't they heal sometimes? And again, that's not enough muscle around the bone. So uh, not a good blood supply combined with perhaps overly aggressive surgery, further stripping off blood supply. And then again, where rehabilitation comes in, it's patient education, either being excessively protective and as healing progresses, we actually want weight bearing or being downright stupid and ignoring advice and weight bearing on it too early. All these can impact non-union. So it's this balance of wanting to get the joints moving to avoid stiffness, but also at the same time protecting the wounds from uh, to ensure they heal. And the problem is we need that constant feedback between surgeons and the rehabilitation team because these aren't straightforward cases. These do cause problems. And 
I can't write out a prescription for the whole rehabilitation for my patient once I've finished my operation. We need to reevaluate it and feed back to one, one another. So having said I can't write anything out, this is the kind of thing I do. As I said, there's very little in the research advising rehabilitation, but this is my thoughts. Um, round the back of the, if we go back a click, if you have a look here, round the back of the tibia is FHL. At the front is EDL and EHL. So they're about the only muscles that we elevate round the ankle. And they're also about the only muscles you can move whilst in a plaster. So I really encourage my patients to move their big toes and their little toes day one, partially because I think it stops tendons and muscles sticking down. But I think just as importantly, patients feel like they're, they're being involved in their rehab and they're actively encouraging, uh, actively involved. I'm then pretty strict. I want these wounds to heal. They're under a plaster. Um, I want them to heal and I want them to heal as quickly as possible so that we can get the patient out, out of any cast. So I tell people for 55 minutes out of every hour, I want their foot up. Happy for them to go for a pee, happy for them to get rid of the cup of tea. Um, but apart, apart from that, not much. They will be non-weight bearing usually for about six weeks and then I get an x-ray. And then I'll progressively allow protected weight bearing until 12 weeks. Um, and that will be guided by the fracture, guided by how the x-rays are, and also guided by how much I trust the patient. And unfortunately, quite a lot of these patients, you really can't trust them. Ideally, I would only like them to be in a back slab or a cast for two weeks. I then look at the wounds, and once I'm happy that those wounds are 100% healed, I get them into a removable boot. When they're in the removable boot, I... Um, get active and passive both ankle and subtalum movements and um, I really get them moving it um, and I, I show them what I'm happy for them to do so that they're not too cautious because I've spent ages laying down how we've got a uh, this is a bad injury etc and quite often patients are all, all very timid at this point um, I always, always see them the week after I've taken them out of cast because if we're going to have a wound breakdown, that's when I need to know. So if I can't see them, I need feedback from the physiotherapy team, from the rehab team to tell me, actually, you know that wound looked grand, it's now looking a bit pink. And if I see it then, we can put them back in plaster to let the wound continue healing. And then really often it's three months before they can fully weight bear. And that's, once I'm happy the bone's uh, okay, we can really get it moving. So, sorry for overrunning a bit, but in summary, these are almost inevitably high energy injuries which have horrific impacts on patients. And our job as surgeons and as uh, physiotherapists and uh, allied health professionals is to try to improve the impact. We can't undo what's happened. What we can do is make it a bit easier to live with. Um, we're still working on the best way to, to fix these. And ideally, we would like to come up with some way where we can accurately put everything together without threatening the skin. But I think the reason this is such a good example of the working together of surgeon and therapist is because really it's a soft tissue injury which happens to have a broken bone. And we, we need that tailored interaction between surgeon and therapy team to really get get the most from these injuries thank you very much thank you simon for a great talk um yes i've learned loads thank you very much we've had a few questions come through um so i think you probably covered this um a little bit if we just make sure a um, question from sarah kind of when you're deciding when the right time for these patients to start weight bearing obviously there's a few things you need to consider um what are kind of the main things you mentioned kind of this that how much the fractures healed are you looking for a certain percentage of callus formation 
So it's usually, I think if you wait until you actually see x-ray evidence of healing, mm. that they've been kept non-weight bearing for too long. So it's a combination of how, what the bone was like, how bad the fracture was like, how confident I am in my fixation. So if it's a little old lady with papery thin bone, and I've only managed to get two good screws in, they'll be kept off. If it's a professional athlete with bone like titanium, um, as long as my six week x-ray or possibly even earlier looks okay, I may not see signs of uh, healing, but I'm confident that they're gonna wait there. But also, as I said, it's partially, do you trust the patient? Mm. Um, sometimes, as soon as you tell patients they can begin putting some weight through, they go ballistic and tell you they're out jogging the other day. Uh, and also, some patients just apply a bit more force due to their body size. So, uh, again, it's that balancing. Kind of, yeah, that kind of links with Nick's question, is that why do you feel that we can't trust a lot of these patients? Is it their age group or some other factor? Do you think about the type of people that sustain them? Uh, I think a fair bit of it is the kind of people. You get people jumping from buildings. You get people stealing cars and crashing them. Often, they are fairly unreliable. Um, unfortunately, they're often smokers for some reason, which again has soft tissue um, uh, implications. Um, I'd like to say the ideal patient is the um, professional sportsman, but unfortunately, op often they aren't because they're from. An, we get an awful lot of pressure from the teams about bone healing and can they possibly get back to playing a week earlier? So. It, you need a motivated patient, and unfortunately, a significant proportion of these patients just aren't life's winners. Mm, okay. And um, do you find that, have you got specifically asked for aquatic therapy with these patients ever, or feel it's necessary? No, uh, yeah, uh, uh, assuming, I mean, obviously, once the wound is healed, mm. uh, yeah, non-weight bearing therapy is great to get, get things moving. Uh, like the Alter G can be quite useful. Yeah, Alter G and aquatic and all, all that kind of thing is great to get some functional range of motion. And um, we're not looking for amazing range of motion. It's not going to happen. But if you can get something that the patient doesn't really notice, their ankle is unduly stiff, by getting it mobilizing early, even before we allow them to fully weight bear, I think that's the key. Yeah. Okay, um, question we've got from Claire Seymour. So her question is about high loading these patients. So things like getting them back to running and sport. Are you looking more towards a year before you can do that? Is it realistic we can get these patients back to those kind of activities? I think, um, I mean, once the bone is healed, the bone is healed. And um, my view is that an ankle is to be used. Um, we know that surprisingly few of these develop arthritis. So if we can give them enough functional motion in the joint to get them high loading and back to high levels of activities, it's certainly something to aim for. Unfortunately, it is a devastating injury and patients, even if, even if I am happy for them to do so, just find they, they can't. So from my point of view, usually by about three months, four months, assuming everything looks encouraging, assuming the bone's healed, I'm happy for them to take up skydiving. Um, but often they just find that some ongoing pain, stiffness, swelling, all that kind of stuff uh, limits what they can do. And they, they tend to find a happy medium with the more motivated patient getting to a higher level usually. Mm. Okay, um, I'm just going to do one more question, just checking the time. Um, a couple of people have asked about taking the meta work out at a later date and when you feel is the best time or the need to do that. I try um, very much not to remove meta work unless I think it's causing problems. Um, most of the meta work we can cover with muscles, so it's not unduly prominent. Uh, and sometimes you've spent ages getting some motion back in in the joint you then lift up all the muscle cause it all to bleed take the plates out leading leaving bleeding bone and then we're surprised when everything sticks down again so 
I'm not convinced, unless I've put a screw in a bad place, which is limiting motion, I personally very rarely think that removing metalwork helps with any symptoms. Sometimes I do it uh, so I can get an MRI, for example. Um, sometimes patients are aware of it. Sometimes I do it if I'm planning further surgery, but I try very much to leave metal in. I suppose if it's just a screw as well, you can take that single screw out and leave the yeah. rest yeah. in place. Yeah, but it's, okay. it's, it's another big insult on an ankle that's <clears throat> only just getting back to normal to open. I mean, sometimes they're very big wounds and there's a lot of um, muscle stuck down. So it's a big insult. And just a final question from Abigail. What kind of range do you feel that they typically typically get of their dorsiflexion? I mean, obviously they need to get plantar grade. Um, yeah. Is that kind of as good as we're expecting? Or um, it, Usually dorsiflexion may lack more than plantar flexion. I'm usually chuffed if they've got 10, 15 degrees of dorsiflexion. Enough to not not be really hindered trying to crouch or something like that more than that and i yeah it it's just yeah they they do end up stiff i mean obviously it all depends there's there's mild pylons and there's bad pylons but 10 15 degrees of motion enough to help offload the midfoot take some of that shock plantar flexion perhaps a bit more 15 20 degrees um but okay. interestingly it's the things that patients don't like is stiffness. That, that's what they come to see me about <coughs> afterwards. Pain is surprisingly rare, unless um, they've got complex regional pain problems or nerve injury. But you would have thought smashing a joint like that, it would hurt. But it tends to be my ankle's really stiff since I smashed it. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Simon. We've had lots of people saying how they've enjoyed the talk and it's been very oh, informative. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there, just looking at time nearly 10 past eight. So just on behalf of BOFAS and AFAP, I'd like to thank Simon for his time this evening and for all of you listening. We've had over 100 of you on the call. So thank you very much. Um, just to let you know that the recording of the webinar will be available on the BOFAS website and the AFAP website in about two weeks time. And this is going to be part of a series. So keep an eye on the website. Our next talk we are planning for the 7th of September. And we will put out on Twitter as well what that talk will be and the link for you to register for that one. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you again, Simon. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.